During normal operation, the current returning to the power source through the GFCI is equal to the current leaving the power source. If we know this, we now can use CTs. And um, Brian, we had a Danzel, I think is what his name was. Denzel, yeah. Denzel, oh, yeah. that he was in University of Southern California, yep. and he did all those experiments. And we didn't talk about it, but there was in that graph there was one spot in there. I think it was in there that talked about the GFCI protection range, and I think it was between four to six milliampere. So he did all these studies to find out, and then we determined what it has to do with weight and the mass in there. He was the first person to actually make a GFCI. His mistake was he never patented it. Yep. So then everybody else took yep. off and did that. He's like the guy that did Visical, the original spreadsheet right. on computers. Uh, he was up in Massachusetts. He never cop. He never uh, whatever protected that that concept. So therefore, he got no money. I'm thinking, right. what a bunch of idiots. Patent it. Do what you got to do. Take it. And if you don't want the money, give the money away. <laughs> but at least you got an <laughs> option here. So the guy in Southern California, he made it the first GFCI. And if anybody wants information, we have that. So okay, that's how it started. So let's get back to work here. All right, so let's take a look at it. So now current leaves the power supply. It all comes back to the power supply. It leaves the power supply. Look at this. This is a CT. It travels through the CT. It goes over to the load. If the electron would have returned only back here to the CT, and it, now the neutral comes right through the CT. Mario, if the current going through the CT is going out and goes through the CT, the electromagnetic fields of those conductors, they don't cancel because we can't cancel, because magnetic fields can't cross each other. But we can take this value of the CT that it would take the polarity, left hand rule on electric current flow theory field, right hand, the left hand rule coming back the other direction, they would have not, the polarities would have been equal. So therefore, there's no magnetic field to the CTCs, and it's like everything's cool. But if electrons leave, and some of it returns to the neutral, most of it does, but there is a little bit of trick of electrons come back to the Earth, the G of CI is supposed to trip between, okay, if it's less than 4 amps, it's not. If it's less than 4 milliampers, which is thousands of an amp, it's not going to trip. If it's more than 6 milliampers, it is required to trip. Some people say, well, between the four to six milliampers, well, it's no man's land. I'd rather just simply say this. A GFCI is going to trip at five milliampers, plus or minus one. That's where it's going to trip. So if we look at this example here, this is six tenths, hundreds, thousands. So that's where we get into those decimals. We covered that in math. If this is six thousands of an ampere, that means that the electrons are traveling through here. Not all of them are returning back. This CT now is picking up the imbalance of the field between the two. It takes it over to a computer, and the computer says, hey, this is more than 6 milliampers. Now it goes in as a computer. This is a smart device. And then it goes in there, and it says, open up that, or the latch, if it happens to be a circuit breaker, open up that circuit. Anything else I want to say there? I don't, that's all I want to say right now. You guys okay? All right. The equipment grounding wire, we talked about that a little bit earlier. The equipment grounding conductor, or the equipment grounding wire, was the wire that we used from a load taking it back to the source. And we also mentioned a little bit that's called part of an effective ground fault current path. Because by us having a low impedance fault return path at 250.4A5, the effective ground fault current path, that would help open up and clear that fault condition. So we need equipment grounding conductors for the purposes of opening up under short circuit and ground fault condition. But when you get to a GFCI, look how the technology works. The technology operates where it is sensing the imbalance. So if you have 10 amps, 10.006 going out, because we have current going here. Again, it's returning back over here. 10 amps going back this way. 6 milliamps is going this way right here. This detects the imbalance, okay? Then that is going to open it. Notice that green terminal on the receptacle is not connected. We don't need 
an equipment grounding, the code actually calls it an equipment grounding conductor. A theory, we just call it a wire for right now, but the code calls it an equipment grounding conductor. We don't need an equipment grounding conductor on the terminal of, of a receptacle for the GFCI to actually operate because the GFCI operates an imbalance. Now, the code always requires us to have an equipment grounding conductor or an equipment bonding conductor on the receptacle grounding terminal. Mario, give me that code rule that requires. It always requires that equipment grounding to be connected. But there are scenarios in old houses where this old house, it's knob and tube, it's old house, two wire Romex, and there's no equipment grounding conductor. And so therefore, we can't connect the equipment grounding conductor to receptacle. So the general requirement is that you have to have a receptacle connected to the equipment grounding conductor. And Mario, what rule is that? Yes, Mike. Um, that rule is 250.146. Probably not. Go over to 406 um, on the rule about receptacles having to be connected to the equipment grounding conductor. What 250.146 talks about how do you make that connection? And it gives you the different options to do it. So the, there's a general rule that says, hey, receptacles that you install have to be of the grounding type. And then it says the grounding type receptacles have to have that grounding terminal connected to an equipment grounding conductor. So when you get a chance, you find that. Sure. And then that same rule about connecting that equipment grounding conductor, that same rule has a, 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 another reference saying, well, if it's two wire, you don't have to. And what am I trying to say here? I'm not trying to get into code. I just want you to understand that if you look at this graphic here, that that equipment grounding conductor is not shown because I'm just trying to demonstrate it that we don't need it for the purposes of a GFCI function. But once I open up that bag of worms, I want you to know that you are required to connect it to an equipment grounding conductor. And that's going to be 406, I think, Mario. Um, 406.4. Four, um, a grounding type receptacles? It says that. Yeah. You have to have a grounding type receptacle. Right. Right? That's A. Yes. Does it tell us? Methods of grounding? There you go. Okay. Okay. Well, that's so what you're A for. tells you you need to have a grounding type receptacle. And then B says a method of grounding. How does it tell you to ground it? Okay. The equipment grounding conductor contacts of receptacles and cord connectors shall be connected to the equipment grounding conductor of the circuit that supplies that receptacle. And then we would go to 250.146 that tells you what you have to do to receptacles. But I wanted the rule that says, we need, by the, is, there an, is there a rule there that if you replace a receptacle? Yes. And, and there is no equipment grounding conductor? What is that rule? Sh sure, yeah. What uh, is the rule? We, we got to go to 406.4D. If, if you were dealing with a non-grounding type receptacle, paren 2, um, where... Oh, the, we got to stop. Oh, okay. okay. No, you did perfect. You did perfect. When I say we're going to stop, I'm saying that the code recognizes that you might be replacing receptacles. There is no equipment grounding conductor in the box. And I says, wow, that's not good. But I tell you what we'll do. You can put a, see the code says you need grounding type receptacles. Well, the problem is no grounding type, there's no recept, there's no ground wire. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. A says you need grounding type receptacles. B says you need to connect that grounding type receptacle to an equipment grounding conductor. And D says, well, if you replace it and there's no equipment grounding conductor, make it a GFCI type. Now, the GFCI doesn't make it safe because of a ground fault condition. It just is like we're trying to make it safe. So the purpose of GFCIs are to try to make the installation where if in the event of a ground fault traveling through a person that we're going to clear a fault. So let me go back to the graphic. The only thing I really want you to know and understand right now is not the code. I'm just showing you that th there are rules that tie into what we're talking about. I'm only trying to get you to understand that a GFCI has a current transformer within the device. It senses the hot and the neutral looking for an imbalance that it will open at six milliampers and it will not open below four. So it's five milliampers plus or minus one is how it works. Now, anything else we talk about the code, it can be fun stuff. Your instructors can get you into that if they want to. Now, GFCIs detect connections between the neutral wire and the metal parts of the electrical system, maybe like the metal case. If the neutral connection to the metal parts occurs, the GFCI protection device will open. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I understand that. Okay. Why are you teaching this, Mike? Okay. When GFCIs first came out, we, didn't, we had Romex, and we didn't know what it is. We put it in there, and it didn't work. Well, we put some duct tape on there, write a couple little letters in there, throw it away, get another one, and put it inside there. What I didn't realize was that when you put a receptacle in a box, 
and you have your equipment grounding conductor and that bare wire, let's say Romex, makes contact and touches the phase wire, well obviously it's going to trip the breaker because it's a fault, right? It's a it's a short it's a, a ground it's a ground fault fault. But if it touched the neutral wire, there's something internal to the GFCI circuit breaker as well as the GFCI receptacle to look for a neutral to ground connection of that equipment grounding conductor. Without getting in too much detail, that here is your solid state GFCI protection. Here's your hot, here's your neutral. There's another CT that is looking for this neutral wire touching this case. Watch what happens. Electrons, okay, you have this path right here. Now, this CT is a transformer that actually is inducing electromagnetic field in this conductor. So now the primary is the CT, the wire is the conductor, and if you have a closed loop, it will then induce a current, and then the GFCI will see that current traveling through this, even though there's no load that actually is being, in, this load is actually open. I don't need you to get into detail. Maybe your instructors can explain that a little bit better, take some time. Maybe uh, you can even do some experiments. The important point is that there is a technology, and Tom, if I'm wrong about this on the GFCIs, you, you correct me. There is a technology in GFCI protection devices to look for the neutral ground connection. And I think OSHA, if I remember right, I think OSHA has some kind of requirement that the GFCI protection for OSHA job sites that there has to be this neutral ground detection on the job site. Tom, are you familiar with that at all? I am I'm familiar with it. Yeah. I can't quote the number. And, and we're not going to get involved because, see, OSHA is looking for the neutral ground connection, but there are devices that don't provide neutral ground connection. I, we saw those adapters and some other things in there. I'm sure they don't have a neutral ground protection in, in, in those adapters. So that's all I'm saying. You put a GFCI, it might trip. Well, and maybe it tripped because it was a short circuit. Maybe it might trip because it was a was a ground fault, which is a neutral to the equipment enclosure. Um, let, let's hold that concept there, and let's move on. Now, we got to be careful that you don't think that a GFCI is actually going to protect you for the for a couple reasons. If if you touch the hot wire and the neutral wire at the same time, and if you understand how GFCIs operate, they operate on imbalance principles. Well, if you touch a hot and a neutral here, let's say you had a thousand ohms of resistance, which is hard to read here, but if you had a thousand ohms of resistance and you had 120 amperes, well, 120 divided by a thousand is 0.12, and if we convert 0.12 to thousands of an amperes, it's going to be 120 milliamperes. Now, you'd have to go back into another section of the book that we talked about the electric shock, and we said that Females, the studies have shown with Danzel, his study, that about 11 milliampers, she's not going to let go. Males, remember we saw that it was plotted, though? I mean, it was just plotted. They, just, they came out to be about 11 for females. I think it was 10.5. And the males were about 16 milliampers. Above that, you were above the let go threshold. As soon as you get above the let go threshold and you can't let go, at some point, you're going to create some problems. It, you're going to get hotter and, and you're going to be getting sweating and then you're going to be uh, with the sweating the conductivity in your hand let's say you're holding on to something maybe you're not getting killed and instantly but then slowly once it gets through the skin that's where there is a big problem because the skin is an insulator the skin provides a, a certain amount of protection probably enough protection for maybe like 30 volts you know but once you get past that now you have voltage going in the body now it has nerves it has muscle fibers, it has the conductivity of the blood, and then all it takes, a little bit go to the heart, and now you go into ventricular fibrillation, and now the heart starts to quiver, okay? So now looking at this graphic again, 1,000 ohm person, 120 volts, we did this calculation before, 120 milliampers. If we went back over to the table, 120 milliampers, was way past the point that you're that you're going to be able to survive that because you're going to go into the ventricular fibrillation and then game's over. So look at the graphic again. GFCI is not going to open because it is not an imbalance. Also, do we have anything about failures? Here we go. Yep. Hazards of GFCIs, it's electronic. 
Anything that electronic is prone to failure. Well, actually, we talked about this um, before, where we talked about uh, um, and the life. And, and Brian, I think you were talking about dielectric and a capacitor. I never thought about it. Well, yeah. why would it short out? Well, it, it, it shorts out because it's used up. It, it, dielectric and, and like search for everything. Out. Everything has end of life. Yeah. Well, electronics have a much shorter end of life than, let's say, a mechanical breaker. Yeah. It's going to have because it's electronics. We haven't got there yet. But we're going to get into surge protection devices. So now GFCIs are computers, and they're little tiny things inside. And 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 Tom, we found out that the insides of GFCI breakers. I think you said it was rated for 5,000 amps available fault current. I think that's what it was, right? The, the insides, the electronics, back yeah, on that little the, short circuit current table. Okay, well, circuit breakers could be close to the service. There could be um, faults. Things could take place that would be a, an innocuous fault, but the fact is it was more than 5,000 amperes. Transients, we'll be talking about transient voltages and events that could take place because of transients. So there's a lot of reasons also Studies have shown they've revised the standard of GFCIs in my career, I think, th three times. Be as they realize, oh, you know what? Ooh, these guys are putting receptacles outside. Never thought about that. And they're putting covers on that. Never thought about that. And it's raining outside. Or there's a sprinkler spraying it. And somehow water is getting inside the cover and, and because there's something attached or it's just getting inside there, uh, there's moisture in there. So then the inside of the receptacles were having failures. And so there was issues associated. And then in, in Florida, there was a lot of, we have a lot of lightning that creates, we're going to talk about this, transients. And so now they were wiping out the electronics of GFCIs. And when you wipe out the electronics, generally the device still works. So now you have it working, but there's no GFCI protection. So I don't want you to feel that if something is GFCI protected, that it is safe. Number one, we don't know if it's properly wired because it can be improperly wired and it's not going to be sensed. Uh, we don't know if the electronics have failed. Um, so the code tells us, uh, Mario, find out where the code tells us that GFCI protection devices, Mario, find out where it tells us that, the GFCI protection devices are required to be readily accessible. I just got a text, I just got something on, on YouTube, comment. This is a bunch of baloney. Why does a code require to be uh, readily accessible? And he went on and on and on. He says, nobody presses the test button because the whole purpose of having the GFCI readily accessible, meaning the actual test button, is so that you can test it monthly because the instructions say that you have to test it monthly to make sure that it hasn't failed. So Mario, where is the, in the code that tells us that AF, of GFCF protection device have to be readily accessible. Yeah, Mike, that rule is 210.8, um, and it reads, the ground fault circuit interrupter shall be installed at a readily accessible location. Now, we're not going to get into it because this is not a code class, but the code defines what really, readily accessible means. And quickly version of that, Article 100, means you just go walk up to it. You don't have to climb over anything. I mean, you don't have to bring a, you can climb, you know, you don't, you don't have to bring a ladder. You don't have to move anything to get to it. So let's talk about GFCIs. It detects the imbalance between the hot, between the circuit conductors. Um, they have a they have a failure rate associated with them. And we could touch two wires of a GFCI, and, and, and it might not trip at all because we are simply part of that circuit. The GFCI test button. Now, when I worked as an electrician, you know, GFCIs had just come out, and I remember seeing GFCIs, and I would press the test button, and it didn't work. I just thought, hmm. Bad test button. I did not know what that means is that the electronics have failed inside that particular GFCI. That's why we have to test it monthly. If I use something and, and if it's convenient, readily accessible, and there's a GFCI test and reset button, I will test, press it and test it. I would not have done that in the past. But now that I understand more why it's important. So let's look at the test button. By the way, I don't think we say that in my book, and we might need to say this in there, and Tom, you'll verify that, that the only way that you can test a GFCI is to press the test button. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. the only way that you can test when we get into AFCIs is to press the test button yeah. on the device. All these other little things that you can buy, the plug into a receptacle, the test button. <laughs> Those are good. 
Yeah. The, but the but 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 the way UL likes to reference them, and 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 I think the way they're used is indicators, right? So if you have a if you have a requirement that says this receptacle needs to be protected by GFCI, if you plug your tester or you plug that indicator into that receptacle and you press the button and it trips the circuit breaker or the upstream GFCI receptacle, then you know it's protected by a GFCI. That's a very convenient way to isolate that. But if it didn't trip that GFCI device and you walk over and you press the test button and you press the reset button and it works fine, then you've tested it by pressing the button. So don't use the indicator as the method to fail or accept that GFCI. All right, so let's look at the test button. All right, here we go. We have line coming in, going through the CT, going out to the load, returning back to the load. As long as it's balanced, we don't have a problem. If I press the test button, oh, here, let's look at the test button. We have a hot wire going through the CT, going up to the test button. Let's just make it white. Let's say it's a neutral with a resistor. And, and, and then we go back along here on the outside of the CT. Let me just kind of zoom in here. Oops. Okay. So hot goes to the CT, but the return current, which is a neutral, does not go to the CT because we're trying to measure the imbalance. So if I press this button, Brian, I would like pressing the button, how many milliampers, minimum milliampers traveling through this CT while this electronics is watching this go around? Got to be more than six. Right. So if I do that more than six, we know what the nominal system voltage is. We could actually engineer what size resistor because when I press this button, I'm not looking to do a short circuit, right? I'm just looking to get something more than six milliampers. So therefore, 120 volts at, let's say, six milliampers. The resistance could be, I can't remember what that 20, value is. 20,000 ohms. 20,000 20, ohms? Yeah. So you press the button, you get six, seven, eight milliampers. Okay, well, six milliampers, it tests. So now, that's how that works. Okay. Since okay. we're talking about how they work, okay. I found the coolest thing online while you were doing this. What? Which is, and by the way, Ryan Jackson put a comment. We're all saying Dazelle's name wrong. It's Oh, I had a feeling of that. It's da Dalil, he said. What it's is it? Dalil. Dalil. He's a Scottish guy. So the Z is silent. Ooh. Dalil. Dalil. Yeah. Dalil. Um, Thanks, Ryan Jackson. <clears throat> yeah. Buddy. Um, but let me see here. Let me pull my laptop up here. Okay. This is the patent. From Dalil, or, right? Did he patent From Dalil. He, he did patent it. He did patent oh, it. Oh, I was wrong about that. In 1965. When you said that, I was like, who the heck patented Somebody had to have patented ah, it. Ah, I did not know he 1965, he, he patented it. Did he or was it Southern California? Well, it says C.F. Dalil. And okay. It's got oh. the U.S. Patent Office. Okay. I don't know. Okay, it gets hit. But 1965, filed on May 31st, 1963. So these jokers have been around, at least the idea for them. Uh, for a long time. That's really, really cool. And he had PDF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he filed a PDF. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. That's perfect. Did Brian, Ryan give you that information? No, I found that. Ryan uh, jumped on the stream a little while ago, and I happened to find that while I was looking. Okay, how do we know about the name was wrong? Is that right? Ryan. No, okay. Ryan said the name was wrong, yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, let's look at the test button here, okay? The electrons are traveling through this. You press test button, 20,000 uh, ohms. It's going to give you 6 milliampers. The computer says, hey, uh, there's 6 milliampers. For whatever reason it's there, it, it just knows that it's there. And then we trip it there.